So welcome everyone to this talk about Christopher Alexander, pioneer of the second Renaissance, uh, or you can insert, you know, integral, metamodern, um, you know, new paradigm thinker. And I want to start with a little bit of a story just about how kind of I came to this um, personally. So I remember I was like about 16 years old and I am with a friend or kind of at least someone I hung out with at school. And there's this moment where we're in his garden and he literally just picks, he picks this kind of rose, uh, which is just flowered and he rips it apart. And I, I remember, I remember like just being so kind of, I don't know, just kind of shocked. I mean, it was, and I said to him like, why, why did you do that? Like, why did you destroy this rose? He said, well, you know, I felt like it. I wanted, you know, and this moment I was, what really struck me was that both in my heart, I felt incredibly that, that, that there was something kind of wrong in a way. Like there was definitely the whole rose was better than a destroyed rose, right? There was something, there was something different between those two things. And it wasn't just a matter of opinion. But the other thing was that I was completely tongue-tied. I couldn't think of anything that I could say that would change his mind, essentially. Um, that was what also really struck me. I couldn't think of an argument. And I did say something to him. I said, like, you know, why do you do that? Like it was, why, why pull it apart? And he was like, well as I said, I wanted to. And I was like, well, it'd be better as it was holding. He's like, well, I felt like it. And you have that thing like, well, he felt like it and it's his garden. And who am I to say, you know, I might like it not pulled apart, but maybe he likes it pulled apart. You know, some people like spicy food. Some people don't, you know, what's the difference? And I thought that there's something very um, deep about that. And I would say it went deeper, you know, like that, group of people I knew, you know, they vandal ended up vandalizing things. Um, you know, they, they, it wasn't just a rose, you know, stuff. And there was no real, there was this really deep sense of nihilism, moral and aesthetic nihilism that was there fundamentally. And I'm brings me to kind of Alexander is that for me, Alexander is this incredible, um, figure because when i came across him uh soon after that was that he kind of does tell us that value is real you know i you know that reason and and he does it also in a reason based way you know so reason in the, the kind of reductionist version of reason has led to deconstruction to the extent we have any ethics they're just kind of left over from a pre-modern past you know they they're a little bit of our judeo christian heritage which we somehow have kept around but they don't really make sense when you think about them you know if he like ripping apart the flower why shouldn't he so there are several ways out i think of this modern postmodern trap and they are also the way out of this i think is also central to a second renaissance there's buddhism and zen uh there's ian mcgillchrist there's wilbur and integral there's and there's christopher alexander and there might be others but christopher alexander i think exhibits certain really um interesting features i mean first of all by the way he's just so he's such a pioneer right he's doing this in the, the 70s and, and and 80s and 90s you know he's writing this work and he kind of combines reason you know he he's he studies mathematics at cambridge um he gets the first ph maybe only phd in architecture from harvard and he's really coming from a reason and science-based background as well and to part of the metaphor, he's got a very concrete application. He's an architect. He's talking about something that we can see, we can experience, we can go into, we can live in. I also just want to make a caveat at the beginning here. When I say about Alexander, um, I am talking about Alexander and his colleagues. So I am going to keep talking about him. And I think he is probably the driving force behind us this, but in most of his books are co-authored. Most of his buildings are co-built. So when I say Christopher Alexander, think Christopher Alexander and colleagues. Now, Alexander, just to say a bit about him, if you haven't ever heard of Christopher Alexander, he was born in 1936. He died, uh, sadly, he died two years ago. And he's a major figure in post-war 
architecture. I mean, he, he was known, you know, he is often mentioned in architects course, but he has never become, he definitely was never become actually central. He's kind of a bit of a side figure. He never got to build any really major buildings. Um, the largest kind of building complex he built was in Japan in the 1980s for a, basically a private university. And all of his big commissions never really happened. And for example, by contrast, you know, he has a very famous debate at Harvard in 1982 against Eisenman, uh, who kind of exemplifies postmodern architecture. And Eisenman has gone on to have like a massive practice. Uh, he built the, you know, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, if you've ever gone to it, and many other things. And so Alexander is kind of like definitely, you know, ahead of his time, I would say. And therefore, but he also has this, just to say, he's got this incredible oeuvre of written work. Um, you know, he's produced, I don't know, like, probably like something like 15,000 pages of work or 10,000, you know, the nature of order is about uh, 2000 pages long. Um, and, and all of it's riveting, by the way, it's not, it's not boring stuff. And as you can see, so he's written about, you know, 12, 12 volumes and uh, volume 13 got published in 2012. He has actually though also built multiple buildings and multiple complexes. You know, he's advised people. Um, he has a whole, you know, there is a whole school of people who followed him um, and he has a center at Berkeley. I had a center at Berkeley uh, and and also had, you know, as people, some of the people in this call know, he had major influence, funny enough, maybe more influence outside of architecture. Um, so he was the inspiration for patterns in software, uh, pattern languages, basically for agile software processes is a major influence directly from Alexander, the idea of kind of iteration, um, many, many key ideas in how modern software architecture as a process is done come from Alexander. And he was somewhat bemused actually in the 1990s where he'd come and give these talks to major auditoriums of software developers. And he had no idea, you know, he was like, well, I'm, I'm an architect, what, what am I doing here? So he's something of a kind of prophet without honor in his own country. Um, but I want to talk today only, I, I could talk a lot about different aspects of Alexander's work, but essentially what I want to talk today is about this point about value, that Alexander was a revolutionary and is therefore also why he's so controversial and to some extent still very much unfollowed in architecture, because he asserted something that in modernity is basically um, heresy, uh, and which is simply that value is real. That aesthetics are real, that the good and the beautiful are not simply opinions, they're not subjective, they are objective, they are timeless, they are universal in some way. Um, and obviously, this is a huge aspect of what's kind of coming back into fashion. It's, I think, a large part, uh, directly or indirectly, of like McKilchrist's work and why he's such a major thinker of the Second Renaissance or of this emerging poem. It's obviously the core of the recent work, I mean, really explicitly the core of the work of the recent book by Stein, Zach Stein, Mark Gaffney, and um, Ken Wilber that really kind of distills in one package often what's implicit and integral that like value, the first principles and first value that like value is real, like, the, and that we need to kind of, that not seeing this is major part of the breakdown in modernity and post-modernity, which is there in all of Wilber's and integral work really explicitly or implicitly. Um, I think what's interesting about Alexander, I'd say McGilchrist does it as well to an extent, but it's the grounding in reason and the grounding in something that you can see. What's very special about Alexander is he says all of this, but he's also able to actually point at buildings and show you pictures and discuss things and uh, describe an actual process for realizing this, the, what he would call the living or the whole or the timeless essence. So today, because this is supposed to be a pretty short talk, I'm just going to illustrate a little of this from The Timeless Way, one of his earliest books, published in 1979, and a little bit from The Luminous Ground, basically his penultimate book, published in 20, 2004, but produced over a period of 20 or 30 years, actually. So first of all, The Timeless Way of Building was the is always listed as the first in the trilogy. If you look back here in the list of books, and you can read it on my screen, volume one of his works uh, in the, the front piece of his final books was always the timeless way of building it was actually published um it was actually published third it was published after the patent language and the oregon experiment but i think he authored it first and it was intended to always be the foundation stone in the first trilogy and in his work um patterns which are and the patent language which is by far i think the most famous of his works 
and the one that most people uh, maybe have read or, or know of was actually like a means to realize the timeless way. Um, it isn't the end in itself. And it was kind of an illustration of a process. Um, and this is a nameless thing, the timeless way of building and this kind of essential qualities of value. And I think this is very important in the whole discourse of value aren't, can't be named. They can't be, they're actually precise, as he said, but they aren't precise in language. You cannot describe them. And it's a way, it's a, it's a, as, as uh, Stein and Gaffney and Wilber say, it's a field of value. When he says, he's not coming and saying value is X. It's saying that value exists. There is an up in the world, morally and aesthetically. It doesn't mean that we know exactly the up, that I, Rufus, or I, Christopher Alexander, or whoever it is, has that. But we are not in flatland. We're not in a world where destroying the rose or not destroying the woes are equally good or equally a set or a destroyed rose and a whole rose are equally beautiful, or it's just a matter of opinion. Uh, so it's, this is the kind of essential quote and what I, these illustrations are from the book behind it. And it's very classical Alexander. He shows these pictures. And in fact, even these pictures, which come together on three subsequent pages are carefully chosen. He's not trying to say this is something grand architecture, like a cathedral. You know, it it could be a simple balcony in in a in a in a in a homestead. It can also be found in an urban environment. This isn't just nature. Each of these illustrations for him, I think, is showing buildings which have or spaces which have some essence of this timeless way of of wholeness, or will come what it is. But as he said, this quote here: "There is one timeless way of building." It is thousands of years old and the same today as it has always been. The great traditional buildings of the past, the villages and tents and temples in which man and woman feels at home have always been made by people who were very close to the center of this way. It is not possible to make great buildings or great towns, beautiful places, places where you feel yourself, places where you feel alive, except by following this way. And as you will say, see, this way will lead anyone who looks for it to buildings which are themselves as ancient in their form as the trees and hills and as our faces are. I think another point to make is that what I think is also special about Alexander, and I feel it often in, in McGilchrist, is that his very work is itself self-evidencing. The books are beautifully written they are beautifully illustrated they themselves are beautifully designed you know the typeface is is his kind of right um so alexander's work also kind of illustrates in itself similarly like in mcgillchrist there's this kind of woven together of these arguments and this kind of intellectual thesis with a kind of poetry a depth of knowledge a kind of richness of language of prose that you know is quite special so just to illustrate it and kind of point it out, it's timeless. It's universal. The timelessness is timeless. It's universal. It's the same as it's always been. And it's a feature. It's something that we can sense or it, 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 it's a fundamental invariant aspect of the world and which manifests itself in these buildings. And there is no other way in which a building or a town which lives can possibly be made. I can imagine this is what gets people reactive about Alexander and certainly the postmodern concept. He's quite, he's, he's strong on this view. He's not like saying, oh, you know, this is just an opinion. This is true for him and for the world. So I'm just going to go and go this quality. So he talks about the quality and the section in which he does this is kind of amazing. And again, it illustrates this absolute aspect of Alexander. So I could just say philosophically, hey, there's this thing, and it could even be mystical, like I'm a sage or I'm I'm a mystic, I'm a, uh, and in a way Alexander is, as we'll see, but it could be, it's just like, you'll know, or just trust me. You know, he could just be saying, trust me, I, I feel this. But he's not doing that. He makes real attempts to really detail, to be specific about this quality, while constantly illustrate saying that you cannot, Whatever we say, it will always transcend that. It will always go beyond our grasp. So it's both partly graspable 
and transcends our grasp. In this way, it's very Zen, it's very non-dual. It's, it's this aspect of holding paradox. We can talk about it. We can describe a bit. We can even do mathematical analysis about it. And yet it is not reducible to that. It manifests in the material, yet it is maybe not material. So to seek this timeless way, we must know it. So the quality of that name, there is a central quality, which is the root criterion of life and spirit in a man, a town, a building, or a wilderness. This quality is objective and precise, but it cannot be named. Do you see that? how that would just blow the mind, right, of any... Of, of in, in a modern context, it would have, for me, I remember when I sometimes first read this, I didn't really get it for myself. I really didn't at the beginning. When I first came across it in my 20s. Like, I loved the pant language, kind of interested in the timeless way, but it's like nature of order. I kind of struggled with these parts. Because how can it be objective and precise, but not nameless, but, and nameless? Isn't that a contradiction? So we've been taught, and now this phrase, this we actually posted a while ago on our site, I think, this is just this incredible manifesto against modernity and postmodernity. You're transcending, they're not against them, but at the time I think he was quite angry. If you read his lecture with Eisenman, I think he's angry to see what we were doing to the world, what we've done to our built environment, and what we're doing to ourselves, what we're doing to the world, which I think, but, but a kind of loving, righteous anger. We've been taught that there is no objective difference between good buildings and bad, good towns and bad. The fact is that the difference between a good building and a bad building, between a good town and a bad town, is an objective matter. It is the difference between health and sickness, wholeness and dividedness, self-maintenance and self-destruction. In a world which is healthy, whole, alive, and self-maintaining, people themselves can be alive and self-creating. In a world which is unwhole and self-destroying, people cannot be alive. They will inevitably themselves be self-destroying and miserable. But it is easy to understand why people believe so firmly there is no single solid basis for the difference between good building and bad. It happens because a synchro central quality which makes the difference cannot be named. Now, this is, I'm just going to pause here and say, again, this is a huge connection and subtlety in building up the new philosophical and ontological foundations of let's call it integral metamodernism, a second renaissance and a waking society, which is that the difficulty is, is it cannot be named. It's, it can be pointed to. And this then is also this term like opening the eye of value. We have to have ways that we can perceive it. A lot of Alexander will go on like, how do you feel wholeness or the living in a building? And he'll say, well, you, you know, but you, you can feel it. And yet obviously he also says it has to be trained. Not everyone has this ability in the same level. And this is, I don't have enough time in this talk, but this is a really important and subtle thing that we need to get into is, you know, the obvious reaction is, well, if you know it, you know, Christopher, well, you know, well, you know who do you to get to say, you know, what buildings get built or whatever? Like, how do you deal with sensing these qualities which aren't objective, like I can put in the same way, um, right? Like that in the sense that we can kind of get out a ruler and measure it. Now that comes to like, well, how do you clarify the eye of value? That's the kind of Stein, Gaffney, Wilbur phraseology. But you see in any other tradition, there are people who you can't measure being awakened in, in the Buddhist tradition. Yet there is a community of practice that can assess it in theory. Now they make mistakes. It's not perfect, but there is a way of doing it in a way that, that, you, that you do these things and so on and so forth. I, this is a much longer conversation, but I want to point and make a footnote. This leads into the crucial discussion of like, how do you build communities of practice who can sense these things if they aren't precisely describable in the classic objective modernity science sense? So he then goes on to list these eight qualities. And I'm going to go through these a little quickly because of time. Um, but it's just incredible because he goes through these qualities in the book and he says, okay, well, let, this is one feature. So it's not that there's no features we can say, but each one he then says why they're not quite sufficient, why they're missing something. So alive, you know, that aliveness is a quality you can feel that is this timeless way, that is what you want in buildings or spaces, that quality of aliveness. Okay. Then there's wholeness. You'll say, okay, well, aliveness isn't quite enough. Well, there's wholeness. 
A thing is whole according to how free it is of inner contradictions. When it is at war with itself and gives rise to force, we act to tear it down. So he even describes what these things are. He's not just using a word. He goes into illustrating. Comfortable. And he's like, you know, the word comfortable has been kind of degraded, but really comfort is more than just this, oh, it feels nice. It's like, you know, that cup that fits your hand, that really works with your body. You know, a, ba a chair that really is comfortable, that feels right. A, a place you sit next to the window where it's sunny. Then he talks about free. The lack of openness in the words whole and comfortable is the word free. So he talks about that. But then freedom isn't maybe enough. Maybe exactness, because freedom can sound like you just can do whatever you want, right? Whatever I want, however we do it. Ah, oh, no, there's an exactness that balances freedom. Each of these words complements and builds on the other. They're kind of this kind of network that come together. And then he talks about egoless, you know, which goes much deeper than the word exact. What we want are, are spaces that lack ego. You know, think of how many postmodern buildings, they're basically designed so they look good in a photograph. They look good in the architecture exhibition. You know, our whole world is built in exhibitions. I think they even give architecture prizes without having someone gone and actually lived or stayed in the building. We live in a world of images. And then at last world, which can help to catch the quality without name is the word eternal. So he's given these different words, each one of which he says is insufficient. And he says, and finally he says, and yet so you see, in spite of every effort to give this quality a name, there is no single name which captures it. It will always, so it's this beautiful quality. We can point to it like Buddha's teachings. Buddha, Buddha both teaches us, we can talk about the path. There is the eightfold path. There are the four noble truths in the relative dimension. And yet in the ultimate we always transcend it. You know, his teaching is never the teaching. If you confuse his teaching with what he's actually teaching, you get the booby prize, right? It's a finger pointing at the moon. But that doesn't mean the truth isn't there, that what Buddha is pointing to or Alexander is pointing to is not there and isn't real, ontologically real, and can be partly sensed, partly felt. And he also said it hints at the religious quality. This hint is accurate. And yet it makes it seem as though the quality which is which that pond has, he's described this incredible pond in Japan before this, has a, is a mysterious one. And he's like, it's, it is, I mean, in a way it is mysterious and it's not mysterious. It is also ordinary. What he's trying to say is don't think it's something that's super mundane. It is imminent. It's transcendent and imminent in this world. So I'm going to move on in the last... So just to kind of jump forward, because the luminous ground is like volume four of this, uh, of his Meisterwork. So out of that, he produced this four volume Meisterwork, which kind of supersedes everything he did before, The Nature of Order, uh, an essay on the art of building and the nature of the universe. And this was book four. And it, I'm not going to say that much on it today. Um, again, I'm going to kind of go quite quickly here. But I want to say is that he comes clean in a way here in this book on the mystical dimension. So he says, you know, mystery is that which transcends reason. And he has this discussion here of like, what I call the I is that interior element in a work of art or in a work of nature, which makes one feel related to it. So we could call it spirit. We could call it like, I don't know, consciousness, you know, <laughs> whatever is there in the universe. Um, and it may occur in a leaf or in a picture or in a house or in a wave, even a grain of sand or in an ornament. It is not ego when he used the word i which he will use throughout which is a bit confusing it's not ego it is not me it is not individual at all and having to do with me or you it is humble and enormous and that thing in common which each one of us has it is the spirit which animates each living center i mean this is pure perennial philosophy mysticism here of like that we can touch that which transcends us all which is and it's real um and and in modernity, we're ashamed of this. What I think is striking is he says lower down this page, I don't know if you could say it, that it is because the real heart of the matter is something, he says, I haven't mentioned this in my first three books. I haven't talked about this because it's something we're kind of ashamed about. It's not easily talked about. It's something nearly embarrassing in this day and age to be caught talking about. So we're not feeling entirely comfortable to blurt out too easily even to mention it. But he's kind of like, I've got to tell you this. He's like, in the end, I've got to not, I can't ignore this. I've got to tell you about this. And here's an example, for example, he's talking 
I'll move on a bit because of time, but he's an example of like something touching him when he was making this step, something really spoke to him. Um, anyway, so I want to mention, and I'm getting short on time, so I will end here. Uh, I've got another, another time that we'll come to, but he goes through, I think, and again, is a real precursor to McGilchrist or others. Here he is describing these assumptions of basically modernity of the scientism and the kind of materialist reductionist view of the world, but doing it again, I think not quite like, not be critical, but the tower physics, there's a quite a lot of this, like so much kind of more woo woo stuff from the seventies and eighties. It tends to be like, you know, let's take quantum physics and mix it together or whatever, you know, um, he's doing this in a really rigorous way. And here he has, you know, this, the assumptions, what is true is only the body of those facts, which can be represented as lifeless mechanism matters of value in architecture are, sub are subjective. You know, this classic thing, and he comes the final one, the intuition that something profound is happening in a great work of art is in scientific terms, meaningless. The instinct that there is some kind of deeper meaning in the world is scientifically useless. It has to be ignored as a subject of serious scientific discussion. Um, a modern person, then this quote, which comes, you may privately consider my formulation of these assumptions to be caricatures. Nevertheless, even the very moment of trying to preserve some thread of a connection to the value of existence. Why? What's the point of life? That was what we're all I and my teenage friends, we were lost. There was no point to living, really. Some way of doing it in this homage with the intensity of feeling it evokes the mother. In almost every attempt, the modern person, the modern, the modern person is prevented from embracing his own feelings in any full sense because today's cosmology and the undercurrents I've tried to articulate in the 10 tasks of assumptions simply don't allow it. They deny this reality. And to finish, like he says, it will arrive because this entity I call an I can be confirmed by experience. And I will, and it's this point of also the interest that this will be a science. In the way McGilchrist believes this, he's like, this is this is something that we, like a Buddha believes, this is a science. In the sense of empirical, we can test it ourselves. I believe one day become part of physics, what this, this what he's describing here, part of our understanding of the material universe, which reunites self and matter ourselves with the world. Yeah, this is an essential quality for me of the second resource thinking, which is not only this touching this, being able to talk about it, but the desire to reunite, to reintegrate spirit and matter, as it were, in our science with, with kind of consciousness. We're not rejecting reason, we are including it and going beyond reductionist reason. So I finished there just mentioning, I've mentioned already some of the connections. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rufus. Great. So, um, what shall we go from there? Let's see. Uh, any particular? Yes. Um, yes. Claps. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Appreciation. I would like just half a minute just to sort of like let the questions, let your thoughts sit for a minute and then. And then please put your hand up for questions or comments. Rufus, I was wondering if this last uh, slide or page you showed us with the, the 10 tacit agreements, mm -hmm. if you could share that on the WhatsApp or something. Because I would love to sit and go through those with friends and say, okay, do we get this? Can we argue this? Because I often find that, especially this thing of, of critiquing reason, I don't actually have the proper understanding to stand strongly on my case, even though I believe it. So that would be very cool. I just say one thing. I found it also super useful. I actually had it on a call the other day of just showing it to people. And it's quite a good litmus test of like how modern or, you know, what, where people come on that is kind of really interesting. And it's also really helpful to then be in a dialogue with them of like, okay, so you think that, okay, great. Well, let's, yeah. I mean, there's a longer discussion, but thank you. Yeah. 
I also wanted to say something that I really invite people feel free to dialogue here. So if someone brings something up, please feel free for others to step in and answer it rather than, than me. I, I actually think we didn't do breakout rooms today because that we can sometimes do that, but I just really want to emphasize that I'd be happy for people to like, someone says they can put their hand up and respond or whatever. I put the I put the tacit assumptions uh, screenshot of that into the into the meeting chat if that's any help. Uh, I can put it in the uh, I can put it in the WhatsApp later. Thanks. Um, I guess I have a bit I more think. of a comment. Yeah. Um, um, and maybe to like open up some discussion a little bit too, which is that one of the things that stands out for me is that like this. And I think you might have mentioned this before, Rufus, but like this ability to sense something that's quality um, is kind of like an essential feature of, of whatever you're doing. And it, it kind of goes beyond it. It goes beyond like architecture or other whatever, I guess, whatever your activity you're doing or whatever um, discipline or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, it could be in music, it could be in art, it could be in software engineering or, or whatever it is. So I think what kind of stands out for me is that, um, how do you kind of like uh, understand that trajectory of becoming uh, able to send something good? And how do you like uh, form a career or form like, uh, yeah, the trajectory or the, the life path of like a career or something like that off of that assumption because i think that's so central like the ability to sense something good um yeah and maybe others have thoughts on that that's kind of just what stood out to me that it that it transcends architecture and um how do you kind of uh build that into whatever you're doing into the the life path of whatever you're doing or the trajectory Sorry, Brandon. Yes, Brandon. I also have a maybe a comment and a, like a question that doesn't necessarily have an easy answer. But look at uh, this. If there is even like okay, an acknowledgement of this core value somewhere, and then also a recognition of that a shared universal patterns of being and the aesthetics of life, uh, you know, including architecture, including the ways and patterns in which we live and how we share spaces, how we build spaces, how we design spaces. Um, But just to avoid, though, thinking that certain aesthetic patterns are universal because I think that, you know, just for example, in uh, the, uh, there were times, you know, 200 years ago, for example, in certain European contexts where following Kant's third of, uh, there were some people who had this, they had certain like, you know, background understanding of some of the things that we're talking about here, but then they had uh, an uh, assumption of there being certain aesthetic qualities that were universal and then they wanted to imperialize you know upon everybody and that actually though uh, there's a infinite ways in which perhaps not infinite I think that's kind of the point here is that there's a huge range but that it's somehow constrained because of universal values and you know, maybe shared humanity or shared nature, um, but that, you know, to want actually to, within these, you know, quite broad range, we want to actually rework and maybe reinvent uh, or, re you know, reimagine the aesthetic patterns of living uh, so that we don't, uh, you know, and, and also have this um, uh, diversity. Uh, we want to have... Uh, 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 tolerance and um, appreciation for a lot of different aesthetic po uh, possible aesthetic patterns, you know? So just imagine like, you know, as I was giving that example of like, you know, gosh, I don't know, 
England uh, in 1820 or something like this is the aesthetic pattern everybody should embrace because this is we are so much, you know, more advanced than everybody else or I don't know. So just uh, that's kind of my kind of my riff there. I'm not sure if you guys uh, kind of are following where I'm going with that. Yeah. Yeah. I just try like to, on, sir, come yeah, on I, and, and just I just like to pop pop in very quickly the whole collective dimension in the sense that I'm not so I, I'm not so sure personally about the some some individuals have this you know bigger power to perceive things, but I do think, and I would say this is totally in, in line with all their other thinking, is that is that a collect a, a well connected collective of people really does have a better a perceptive perceptive ability, but yeah. The question, just, just to mm -hmm. go in reverse a little bit, Simon. The question is, the, what are they perceiving? This mm -hmm. is so first, and it answers also Brandon. So the key question at the beginning, and I, I also think Stein and Gaffney and Wilbur do this really well. It's like they're not saying that there's like one. We're saying kind of value, rather maybe values plural. It's not like there's one value. Like courage is the best value. It, the question is though is there is value somehow real or is beauty is there like something really universal and timeless that's what people mean by real right or objective about better buildings than worse it doesn't mean there's one way to do it i want to come back to that but this thing is implicit for example in simon's point it, and i think i'm agreeing with you that it's not maybe one individual being a collective but what are they perceiving is that thing that they're perceiving kind of universal objective you know even they don't perfectly perceive it and there can be different views but there is something kind of there is an up i think that's one thing that alexander's saying now to come back to brandon's very good point is that doesn't mean there's one way to build buildings and i think to illustrate um it, it means though that there are but there are better and worse way buildings do you, do you see what i'm saying is the subtlety which is if you go and talk to architects i've done this as an experiment in the last two years because we're building something and actually ask architects like practicing architects do you think there are better and worse way better and worse buildings they'll say no i mean they'll say something like oh if you mean ecological yes well but you know i'm not i'm like actually is there a better standard for, you know is there like good buildings and not good buildings in general in like and they'll be like no of course not it's subjective and so there's this kind of belief, you know, the, in some they call it the grammar of value, that what we're describing is that the fundamental first belief is that there is value and it's real and that we can access it to some extent. We can sense its presence. Now that within that, there, there's obviously a whole field of kind of values, plural. And now to go into more detail for Alexander, he also does go beyond just saying, oh, it's there. He does say that there are patterns or processes which you can use to build, do that in that way. Now, and, and he talks about features of the living. I mean, a lot of the nature of order is then trying to be, I can imagine he's argued for years on these kind of points with people. And his nature of order is kind of the distillation of his years of obviously debating the rest of the architecture procession. And just to give you a very quick illustration, like one is the, the fact that he do, I think Alexander would probably say, and I don't know, he's not here, but would say, you're probably not going to be able to build something with this quality, with these kind of this, this aspect, if you build, if you don't build in some way in an, iterative or kind of feedback based way if you basically design something and build it which is the way we build almost all buildings today which is there's an architect's plan and within within you have very little chance to change it you build it you will never build something whole and living and beautiful all the things that have that quality were built incrementally by making adjustments as they went along and his point is that's how animal ever well, living works if you look at a sunflower each sunflower is unique, right? If you really look, each one of them is different, but they have a common pattern and process of unfolding from given by the DNA and other things. And they're adjust, but they adjust. Each part of the circle of the, the, the sunflower adjusts. That's one example. I mean, another example, you'd say things that have beauty goes to these 15 properties, which I won't list here, but one of which you can see behind me on this wall. This wall has levels of scale. Normal walls, like the ceiling of this room, have no levels of scale. They're just one universal white. The wall behind me has at least two levels of scale, the wall and the stones in it. Probably even three if you look carefully. Like the stones have different colors. There's the, the plaster between the stones. That is more whole for human beings or more. It's the living. The living has levels of scale, um, for example. So 
there are these kind of patterns and principles by which he thinks that you can do it. And I mean, and he, his point about the science of maybe building is that we should be an inquiry for what he calls these generator sequences or these the combination of patterns and generators that allow us to build um, in this way. And that isn't like one of those, there's many. Um, yeah, and thank you. I wanted to say, Stefan, building beauty, I was going to call out and I didn't have time. I, but, you know, um, you know, there's this archive of documents, Chris Alexander, there's building beauty program and there's like Stefan Lesser, Stefan, who's on this call and being very humbly silent, has got an amazing um, funny introduction. But he's also got an amazing set of notes on the nature of order, which is how I came across Stefan, uh, which will really show that he really <laughs> understands uh, a lot of it really well. So I really can't acknowledge him enough also i feel like i should say at least thank you <laughs> but yeah i'm happy to uh if you have any questions about alexander just send them my way i probably cannot guarantee that i have all the answers but i can potentially point you somewhere please let's see what the time is there's still a few minutes left um i think the the point i would like to sort of um pop in here is okay some people find this difficult um now i think what i'm hearing from you rufus is that that's because they're trapped in and from alexander as well is that that's because they're trapped in the tacit assumptions of modernism um but i i, I kind of want to just just i mean maybe later we can't do it all now but i'd like to drill into that a little bit and say well okay to what extent is it individuals being trapped in the tacit assumptions of modernism modernism being the kind of bogeyman here uh to what extent is it and, and or, or whatever it is how can we lead people out of those and i think that is a big question which we keep on coming back to in this in this forum like how can we lead people through those um you know the deliberately developmental space aspect of this whole kind of the whole topics that we're talking about how can we lead people out of those limiting assumptions or tacit assumptions into seeing and how do we know that they're there that kind of thing i think i think the thing that is yeah such a great question is the one i'm constantly asking is how do you open the eye of value like how do you have people touch this mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. why alexander is so amazing and i in this talk which is a little bit more i'd say abstract and also short, what I think is so amazing about Alexander is there's all of these photos and illustrations and examples and descriptions um, of, of it that start to touch you. You know, as you read it, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I do remember places I felt really well. And it's not just a kind of delusion. And, um, you know, there are certain experiments that I'd like to do. It's difficult. Alexander says he did them at one point where he did these slight experiments of like the problem with the word beauty in English has got a bit kind of polluted and it's got taken over as, yeah. So he's got this idea that if you go and ask people where they feel more whole, you get a lot of consensus. I mean, it's not a hundred percent, but you get, you can start doing these illustrations to people of like, oh no, there is this common quality that we can sense. I think the other one is, is just to pick examples like, do you really, like, is there not anywhere in your life that you have felt that, you know, like you felt beauty and wholeness and being kind of moved almost spiritually by it? Almost everyone has, maybe it's in nature. And then you're just saying to them, but feel into that. Like, why, you know, why deny, you know, why deny the realness? Of it? Now, I think then there's a point where you say to people, listen, and I think it's a concern of like, okay, what, there's something similar different from what we did in modernity of how we got agreement which we get our meter rule you know it's not going to be quite like we all go in the same space and we always know to the same degree how much wholeness there is like we can give it a seven out of ten on the same scale but that because this is where people kind of get reluctant they're like oh but does that mean that there's the right and wrong and you know better or someone knows better and it's like well you know there's something there's something about it but you know the other example is just like is there is there anyone who would say look if my kid i've got my kid and my kid just starts randomly hitting other kids and like hitting smaller kids and like violently attacking them that's okay like that, that that you'd be happy as a parent that your kid was doing that it's like no parent would say that they'd be like oh i prefer my kid didn't do that 
you know, like that, that, that we kind of deep down know there's some some commonality. So I think that's an access. I know Sammy. Sammy, you're on mute. Uh, but yeah, please go ahead, Sammy. I just want to say, yes, Sammy, please go ahead and then we can start wrapping up uh, yeah, respecting just, just people's observation, time. Observation related to this, like when I joined the call, I was a bit tired and lethargic, but, but seeing the pictures and re reading or listening to this, uh, it was very interesting. I started to feel very bubbly and alive inside for some reason. I felt like in you know, a small jungle or something and it was a very experiential thing. But again, now that the uh, we again shifted to conversation, conceptual world, putting this to verse analysis. I felt that kind of uh, experience again coming a bit more stiff, a uh, bit lethargic. So I was just wondering, it's probably about something like this experiential, mm -hmm. but how to kind of have that space and time to stop to feel into those. Uh, like we probably do it a lot in our own lives, but what about people who are not into this space? Uh, I'm just thinking that how could this be somehow enabled more? Uh, how could people have more time to actually tune into those experiences and be conscious that they are feeling those? Just an observation related to this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. 